So I'm, I'm participating uh, this year primarily um, to learn about, about, the, uh, about Boink, about the community at large. Um, so I really appreciate uh, the, the previous speakers. I, I've learned a lot. Um, it's, it's really been an eye-opening experience. So I'm here today to talk about uh, Black Holes at Home. Um, and uh, it probably comes as no big surprise, but uh, the, as, I've, as a professional black hole researcher, I found that uh, the idea of black holes it captivates the imagination. And uh, certainly there's been a lot of uh, interest in, in this project. Uh, so why uh, Black Holes at Home? I just wanna say a few words about motivating this. And, and frankly, I wanna keep my talk short today uh, to give a little bit of extra time in case there are uh, questions or discussion. Uh, so first, why Black Holes at Home? What is the motivation behind this project? Here's a census of detected gravitational waves to date. The blue dots indicate black holes. And as you can see, um, the systems where we have two black holes orbiting and merging um, make up more than 90% of all the detected gravitational waves. So this is a very important scenario for us to be considering in the age of gravitational wave astronomy. So here's how it works. Uh, you have two black holes, they're orbiting in space. They emit gravitational waves. The waves themselves carry energy from the black holes, making them move closer and closer together. This is a very energy uh, keeping the black holes apart. The waves get stronger faster as they get closer, leading to a runaway effect that causes the black holes to collide and merge into one giant black hole. And this is basically what the gravitational wave looks like. Now, the reason why we've, we've built these very expensive gravitational wave detectors like LIGO um, is because they're a scientific treasure trove and they contain important information about the black holes. Um, and the way we extract science from gravitational waves is as follows. We compare each gravitational wave that's detected against millions of theoretical predictions to extract the essential science. Science regarding uh, the properties of the black holes and their orbits. And these predictions have to be built on catalogs of black hole collision simulations that are performed in Einsteinian gravity, known as general relativity. So the issue is, uh, that's facing my field, is that the existing black hole collision catalogs, the simulation catalogs, aren't large or accurate enough for planned gravitational wave detectors. In fact, uh, as the LIGO Observatory, our most sensitive uh, observatory on Earth, uh, is scheduled to come online in a few months, um, there is a strong risk that we will detect a colliding black hole close enough or uh, in, in a region where we're sens most sensitive that existing catalogs are not going to be sufficient to maximize the science gain from those uh, observations. So the challenge is, that's facing my field is in part to develop new techniques for simulating these systems that reduce computational expense and improve accuracy. And that's exactly what Black Holes at Home is aimed to address. But it's easier said than done. Um, just to give you an idea of the complexity and, and challenge that we face, the equations behind uh, general relativity, Einsteinian gravity are complex. It took 90 years to successfully simulate black hole collisions. And that didn't happen until 2005. Uh, just to give you an idea, this is um, actually a very compactified form of the most popular formulation of Einsteinian gravity. Um, and this is the most popular one used when simulating black holes. Uh, since 2005, um, partly as a result of the complexity of the uh, equations that we, have to that we face, as well as we'll see um, the inefficiencies intrinsic to our simulation software, only about 4,000 simulations have been performed across the entire field, uh, my entire research field. And the primary reason is because each simulation to date has required a supercomputer. Black Holes at Home aims to implement new techniques, newly developed techniques um, that have been developed over the past um, eight to 10 years to fit these simulations onto a desktop computer reducing the cost in memory, which is the real, uh, one, of the, one of the real limitations um, to about three gigabytes of memory or less. Just to give you an idea of what these uh, techniques um, revolve around, it's the development of solving Einstein's equations on numerical grids that are more uh, 
uh, that are better adapted to the underlying geometry of the gravitational fields. Black holes aren't cubes, um, nor are their um, gravitational fields very cube-like. So modeling them on these cube-like grids here pictured on the left is not very is not very efficient. In fact, it's inefficient by about a factor of 100 as compared to the grids that black holes at home had. I've developed for black holes at home. Um, the new techniques, the reason why it's taken so long is that a lot of new techniques were needed to be developed um, for getting black holes at home off the ground. And I'm working now on robustness, um, improving the robustness of these new algorithms. Um, I'll just, there are a number of <clears throat> things written here, but I'll just point out that um, to make things run fast on, in particular, x86-64 CPUs, I've implemented basically a similar level optimizations to make it run pretty fast. I will say that, that this does not uh, preclude the possibility that you can't run this on other types of CPUs. In fact, I ran it on my old cell phone, may it rest in peace. Um, but uh, it turns out that you know, cell phones and, uh, and high-end computation, they don't mix very well. Um, but that being said, uh, I think we would be able to support M1s. I'm cautiously um, optimistic about that. Um, latest progress update. Um, the most important thing, uh, the first ever Black Holes at Home catalog is now being generated. Uh, I'm using much faster machines, but still I'm, I'm within that three gigabyte uh, memory uh, threshold. Um, more than 270 oops, simulations are currently running. And these are providing final robustness checks before I declare the core software ready for the Boink, for Boink. Um, and by the way, here's a beautiful picture of the trajectory of the less massive black hole in a, um, in an obser obser from an observer looking um, far away from the black hole, um, 169 different times. There's another black hole, more massive one that started up here, um, but uh, I'm not picturing that because it just makes this already noisy figure even worse. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about black holes and uh, black holes at home and Boink. So we have two servers in place right now. Um, they're rather high-end uh, server grade machines. Each contains about 130 terabytes of memory, which I believe should scale to of order um, 10 to 20,000 uh, users or so. Um, if you, if we, you, you made them fully redundant and double that if we didn't. Um, really, these top three are the, are the biggest concerns in terms of um, managing the, uh, the project. Uh, client plans. So right now, my, my hope is to actually run Black Holes at Home from a Docker image. Uh, I know that this is something that has been done in Boink before. Correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but the idea is, our current idea is the client will compile the code um, specific to their own CPU before running it. Um, it's open and be parallelized, so it, uh, it will use up um, as many cores as it's given. Um, the network bandwidth, this is where we have um, a bit of probably more expense than a typical Boink project. We're talking maybe two gigabytes per day um, because we need to transfer simulation checkpoints so that if one, if your desktop goes offline, uh, your client goes offline, then we can resume it by transferring the checkpoint to another uh, desktop computer. Um, but we are trying to minimize the network bandwidth overhead by using Z standard compression uh, extensively. Uh, memory requirement, um, I'm going to say four gigabytes available right now. We're, we're under three gigabytes or very close to three gigabytes um, uh, memory usage. That's also above average, I think, for a typical Boink project. Storage requirement, maybe not such a big deal. I, I, terabyte, multiple terabyte disks are pretty common these days. So I'm thinking about four gigabytes available should be enough. And just to give you an idea, <clears throat> an idea of the time scale for one simulation, um, I expect if, if we had a dedicated desktop, it should be able to finish between three and six months um, or so. So that's the hope. If we get 10,000, then already um, uh, volunteers and already within, uh, I would say about a year, we should more than double the existing catalogs that exist in, in the world for this particular type of um, uh, gravitational wave prediction. Um, in terms of publicity, I know we talked about this a little bit uh, this morning, so I wanted to underscore some of our, some of my efforts. Yes, I'm a, I'm a professor, I'm an academic, I, but I've, I've tried my best at, at keeping uh, the general public engaged, um, albeit I've, I had to put priority on, on development of the, of the code itself. 
um, on my day-to-day -day work. But there is a Twitter page. Um, I encourage you to uh, follow it if, if you're um, interested. Um, Twitter, BH is at home. Uh, there's been a lot of excitement. I'll show that in just a second. We have a press release ready um, and the launch will be announced on Twitter first. Um, and the idea is folks on Twitter will, uh, groups on Twitter who are interested will get started first. We wanna stress test our servers before we do the big press release that encourages um, more um, participation. I've also instituted a new undergrad visualization team. I remember, because I'm, I'm a very proud former uh, contributor to the SETI at Home project. I remember the amazing screensaver and I'd love to have something like that. Um, and so my undergrad visualization team, this is one of our uh, one of our goals for the future to develop something like that for Black Holes at Home. So you can see what it is that your computer is simulating. Um, and just to give you an idea of some of the excitement that's, uh, that's out there in, in the world about this project. Here are a couple of examples. Um, so I wanted to primarily uh, focus on uh, some open challenges and questions that, um, that we've had, that my, my group has had in, um, in trying to implement Boink uh, both on the server and the client side. So first off, the documentation, it can be hard to find. I, I, I hope this is not uh, new news to anyone. Um, I'll say though, the Discord channel for Boink has been very supportive, really nice. Um, and I'll say that we've been working very hard to document uh, all of our progress toward getting uh, Boink up and running with Black Holes at Home. Um, and uh, the, the documentation, of course, is incomplete because we're not completely finished. I would like to uh, put an open call out for anyone who currently ha is, is running or, or knows of a Docker-based Boink client, because I'd like to get in touch with those uh, Boink managers. That would be very useful for, for our purposes. And in particular, I, I don't want this uh, Docker image to have any sort of elevated privileges on a computer. So a rootless Docker would certainly be uh, preferred. Um, also just wanna ask general advice. You think the client ideas seem reasonable. Um, and I'd also like to uh, call out for what is the most similar client? We, again, we're, we're looking for uh, folks with, with, with whom we can communicate about uh, our, our Boink client as we develop it. Um, the obviously the mo most similar infrastructure we want to uh, emulate uh, for doing that. Um, and finally, a disclaimer, right? The last thing I want is to launch this project and then get sued by a user or a group of users because they didn't know any better. They didn't know that it was going to need this much memory. We don't, they didn't know that it was going to need this much memory bandwidth. And now they're, they were charged a huge amount of money for um, going over some limit if they ran it over tethering on their cell phone or something like that. So that's all I have. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. Um, and thank you for in inviting me and letting me talk about um, this project. Thanks, Zach. That's, that's super cool. Um, any questions? We've got uh, actually a couple coming up. First up was, uh, was Jack. Um, let's give Jack the microphone yeah. here. Hi there. Um, just out of curiosity, um, what, what 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 happened to that cell phone that you had this running on? Uh, that that you know, one of, this, this comes up a lot when we talk about you know a new form factors, and I'm always interested in bad experiences, particularly with cell phone. Yeah, well, um, so it's uh, the code is open and parallelized, so it was trying to use all eight cores on that uh, quad core um, Motorola ARM chip, and. Uh, the thing is, cell phones don't have like cooling uh, fans or anything. <laughs> um, and and the and cell phone cases, I don't know if you've seen a modern cell phone case, but they're usually rubber, which is not a great um, extractor of of heat. It's more of an insulator, in fact. Um, so yeah, uh, I I would I would in fact advise folks from using black holes, running black holes at home on a cell phone. I think they'll do a lot better. Uh, because it's more optimized for desktops in the first place uh, by just doing it on desktops and laptops. Right. Great. Um, next up, uh, Marcus. Uh, yep. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, because uh, you did mention that the uh, one single simulation could take uh, three to six months. 
Um, right. Is this project going to run sort of like a traditional work unit where you'll get a work unit, it'll run for like an hour or two and then send back a yeah. checkpoint? Or is it going to do more of what um, the DHEP project did before where it'll sit on your computer and just occasionally transfer um, saying where you're up to um, and that sort of thing? Yeah, so um, we can't do one hour cadences for checkpoints. That would way overwhelm our servers by, by a large margin. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines of um, eight, eight to 24 hours, depending on how many volunteers we have. Um, but, uh, but yes, I love, I love to have some sort of communication. So could, so could you repeat what you say, DJAP, is that right? DHEP, it was a uh, Boink project um, that hopped on for a little bit and then uh -huh. Uh, disappeared because of lack of funding and what they did was they just had the actual boink task just run like as long as it possibly can just on the boink client and yep. instead of uh, submitting results for the work unit back to the server it would uh, just transmit it using its own own software uh, and then award credits um, on the server side and the submission of the work units would just simply give you just one credit because it's meant to run for as long as possible Gotcha. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I'm cool. going. To, I'm going to need to learn a little bit more about uh, assigning credits for this project. Um, yeah, and just one last thing as well, because um, with the climate prediction, um, I know that their work units can run very, very long, like days or even weeks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's good to know that uh, the work units here will probably take a, a day or so. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, Rice put a comment on that in chat thread. And uh, by the way, uh, um, Oliver, if if your comment is is short, that's a, that's an option. But let's go next to David. Oliver, if your question isn't short, we'll we'll get to you afterwards. It's short. Okay. Oh, I guess uh, um, Alex already gave you the floor. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, Zach, hi. Um, your question about the how to make your users aware of your hardware requirements and um, prevent getting sued. Just put yes. it in your uh, Boink offers this feature um, of the terms of use people have to accept when signing up to your project. You can then probably activate just that and add it to your terms of use, then it's legally binding even, in a sense. Thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I was aware that something like that existed, but I didn't know it's, it was literally just called terms of use. So sorry for the silly question. Thank you for answering it. Great. Uh, next up is David. Yeah, so um, there's a couple, Boink has a couple of features that might be useful to you. Um, one is called trickle messages. It lets uh -huh. the application send messages back to the server in the middle of doing a job. Um, we implemented that for, for climate prediction, which has uh -huh. very, very, at one point, very long running work units. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a feature called intermediate file transfer, where you mm -hmm. can upload files, potentially big checkpoint files. Um, and the uh, so the idea is that these trickle messages, you know, say what fraction of the of the job is finished. And um, in the case of climate prediction, they actually grant credit based on you know sort of the, they, they 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 don't assume that anybody's going to necessarily finish the entire uh, climate simulation. Right. Um, the other thing I, I I didn't catch what language your application is written in is a Python. Uh, no, uh, the it's it's written in C and and the core routines are uh, basically uh, optimized for um, x86 64 similar, although it's cross compatible there. There's a version that's optimized and one that's less optimized. Yeah, so um, you might want to See if you can um, get it to run in GPUs with Open OpenCL. That could bring down your runtime by a pretty big factor. True. Um, yes. Um, that, in fact, is is one thing that we're planning to propose in our in our next. Um, no one has done this. Let me just say, no one in my field has ever run um, uh, this type of simulation on a GPU because, for, frankly, you know, 200 gigabytes of memory requirement is completely out of the question there. So. Yeah. Um, so, you know, yeah. modern GPUs often have, you know, eight gigs of, of video RAM, so it might work. Um, yep. Also, if you're trying to optimize it for different um, uh, features of, of the x86 architecture, mm -hmm. um, you can, in, instead of 
compiling it in the client itself, which is an interesting idea. Uh, you can also um, make uh, versions for for different CPU variants yourself, and then right. use what's called the plan class mechanism to select which version to use for a particular host. Hmm. Um, that that might be a little bit simpler than compiling compiling the code in the client. Right. Right. Um, yeah, that's. Um... That's a, a, a great idea. Um, I mean, the, the issue, of course, is maintaining a number of different, uh, you know, versions for different uh, CPUs. And the fact that, I don't know, the GitHub Actions supports every type of CPU we might encounter, um, probably 98% of them. So maybe it's fine. But um, ultimately, that's what we'd like to have in our, like, at the end of the day, we want to have continuous integration on this and all that good stuff. So, so yeah. 